I want to thank uh, Moody, Alabama for being a wonderful host to us. This is our second Easter out here, and I guess, is that our second Easter? Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, Moody has just been more than wonderful to us out here, and we appreciate it so much uh, as a Bible teaching church. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to have it. We're in a study called Easter 23. Um, uh, and I'm going to go to the book of Acts for this. Acts 2.31 and 32. We've been looking pretty intently at Jesus dies on a cross on the 14th of Nice, which was a Wednesday. He's buried Thursday, Friday, Saturday, according to Matthew 12. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then he's raised on First Fruits Festival. What you really have to understand about the whole crucifixion, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus is how it was connected to Messianic Jewish holidays, which were prophesied in the law of, of Leviticus 23. 1 through 22 tells you four, Jesus had to, Matthew 5, 17, he came to fulfill the law. He had to fulfill four Messianic holidays to be the savior of the world. The first one is called Passover, and he dies. He's the Passover lamb of 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He's the Passover lamb. That takes you back to Exodus 12, where they put the blood over the doorpost of the house, and the death angel passed over, and the firstborns of man and animal died. And so he's called the firstborn. Uh, then as soon as Passover is over on the 14th, then you have Unleavened Bread, the second festival, from the 15th to the 21st. It's a really interesting study of that, pass, of that, of that uh, holiday because the first day and the last day, 15th and 21st, are holy convocations or high Sabbaths. They're viewed like you would a weekly Sabbath as far as the way you conduct your business and life and your life. That means that during that seven-day period, you have a weekly Sabbath, a regular weekly Sabbath, which would be on a Saturday. And the first day after, in Unleavened Bread, the first day after the weekly Sabbath is the festival of first fruits. First fruits, that's, that's when he was raised. So he dies on Passover, He's buried the first three days of unleavened bread. Then we have the weekly Sabbath, and then we have the beginning of First Fruits Festival. Now, why that's important is that now you count seven full weeks. Seven full weeks, which is how many? 49, 49 days. And the 50th day is called the Feast of Weeks. We call it Pentecost in Acts 2. All of those are linked, right? I mean, one spins off from the other. So you have Passover, unleavened bread. He dies, Passover, he is buried during unleavened bread. He is raised. And now he's in post-ascension appearances, uh, uh, pre-ascension, pre uh, post-resurrection appearances for 40 days, and then he goes back to the Father. And then Pentecost comes 10 days later. See, all of that, here's my point, all of that is wonderfully connected in the Word of God. It is amazing to me that nobody teaches that. <laughs> because these are, in that, Matt, in that Leviticus 23, there are seven Messianic holidays that have to be fulfilled. The first four, the first four deal with the first coming of Christ, and the last three deal with the second coming of Christ. There's still three more to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. 
Well, what is interesting to me as a, as a pastor and a teacher of the word is that people, when they talk about resurrection, everybody understands that Jesus' body was put in a tomb, um, but they don't, know, they don't know anything about the burial of his soul. They know about the burial of the body, but they know nothing about the burial of his soul. Three days and three nights, he went to the heart of the earth. He went to a place called Hades in the Greek and Sheol in the Hebrew. And he spent three days and three nights there. And from there, he was resurrected from the dead. So, we've studied all that in detail. If you're a visitor, you can go to our website if you're interested in that studies, how we led up and carried you along the way for you to understand all that. I just, I, I just went through three or four lessons just like that. So here we are in Acts 2. Here we are in Acts 2 about the burial in verse 31, 32. And Peter's talking about the prophetic teaching of David. Most people know David as the king, but he was also a prophet. And talks about him and, uh, and begins to set up the idea because a lot of people thought that when he, when he talked about the resurrection, they thought that David was talking about his resurrection. And David was talking about the resurrection of Christ. And so there was some confusion about it. So in verse 30, and so because he was a prophet, talking about David, and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of the descendants on his throne, he spoke ahead and he spoke ahead and spoke, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. See, that was the problem the disciples had about this. They thought that he would have a, a, a throne, a, a crown without a cross. Thought he would have a throne. Thought he would come and be the king. He will come and be a king, but first he has to be a savior. He looked ahead. He said, David looked ahead in prophecy and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Watch this now that he was neither abandoned to Hades. In Matthew 12, 38 through 40, they call it in the heart of the earth. That he would neither be abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus, God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. There's your Easter story. But here's what's missing. Here's what's missing. Where was Jesus for three days and three nights? And from where was he resurrected? Do you understand? This is what the discussion is. Well, I'm going to read it one more time. I'll have prayer with you so we can get it. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God, God raised up, Again, to which we are all witnesses. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. If you believe the gospel that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, the Holy Spirit lives inside your body and your body is the temple of God. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. He is there to cause the great ministry of Christ on earth through your life. The Holy Spirit is the great, the great teacher of your soul. John 14, 26. You cannot study the Bible. You can't execute the Bible in the flesh. It has to be by the power of the Holy Spirit that, li that lifted Christ out of Hades and indwells your soul, your body. And so, our Father, we thank you today. According to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us 
and to cleanse us from the work of Christ on the cross in verse 7, to restore us to fellowship and to the great ministry of the third member of the Godhead who lives in our life on a daily basis. In John 14, 16, he is not permitted to leave us. It's not a matter of he leaving us. It's a matter of us leaving him by walking in the flesh rather than in the spirit. I pray today as we look at this word of God that we would study it in the spirit and not in the flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at the top of your paper, I wrote out Acts 2, 31, 32 for you. He, David, the king, speaking through the gift of prophecy, prophesied, looked ahead, Messianic prophecy, of Psalm 1610, and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus, new covenant name, new covenant name, Christ was the old covenant name, that's O-C. And Jesus is his new covenant name. He was born and identified to be Jesus. He would be the savior of the sins of his people. God raised up of which we are all witnesses. Now, I want you to hold thir Acts 3 and just go to 13 a moment with me and take a look at this again. In Acts 13, when this is discussed again, in verse 34. 34. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay. He has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. If you have a study Bible, that's Psalm 1610. That's Psalm 1610. He just quoted Psalm 1610. You will not allow your Holy One <coughs> to undergo decay. <coughs> Did you notice <coughs> in Psalm 1610 that we're told, to, uh, we're told something about his soul and we're told something about his body? about his soul, that it would not be abandoned in Hades. That's in the heart of the earth. If you go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 9, you will find it called the lower part of the earth. If you go to Philippians 2, 9 and 10, they will call it underneath the earth. <clears throat> Just, it's on your paper. Something about a soul. Where did his soul go when he died? We know his body went to the grave. We know his spirit returned to the Father. Well, when you read the crucifixion, he's going to do that. He's going to say, Father, in your hands I commit, I commit my spirit. And, he's, and listen, he's quoting Psalms 31.8. That's what he's quoting. 30, it's either 31.8 or 5, one of those. So we're told something, that, and here, here's what he's told about his soul, that it would not be abandoned, agreed? It would not be abandoned. Thanks, Al. Now, if we had a place to put down, we'd be in good shape. <laughs> uh, did you get, did you get, did they give you a study guide when you came in, sir? Let, let, let him give you, William, William, somebody will give you a study guide. Well, how nice. Thank you. Good, sir. You can pass that to the lady who gave him. Well, that's right. Hey. Yeah, well. Did you notice that in Psalm 1610, which is up above and quoted, that we're told something about his soul, that it wouldn't be abandoned. He's going to spend three days and three nights there. It's not going to be, that he will not be abandoned. That's got to be comforting to Christ because he's concerned about that. And it, then it tells him something about his body. What does it say about his body? His body that's in the grave. His soul is in Sheol. He don't want his soul to be abandoned. 
but his body's in the grave. What's, he, what, what's the prophecy about his body that's in the grave? That it would decay. We know from um, I lost his name. After four days, the body decays. Lazarus. We know that story. Uh, after four days, they were worried. They said, well, after four days, the body will stink. <clears throat> I don't know because, but they were worried about it. So he, his body's not going to go into decay. So three days and three nights, he's got to come out of the grave. All right? And he did. So here's the prophecy that David gave in Psalm 1610. Something about his soul that it wouldn't be abandoned, right, in Hades. He even tells you what he's talking about, abandonment in Hades. That's the underworld. That's, uh, in the Greek language. And something about his soul, about his body. Write this down. I don't think I wrote it on your paper. Write down 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It says that the human person, the person, you as a human being, consists of three parts. Uh, a body, soul, and spirit. At death, they all part. Your body goes to grave, your soul goes to heaven or hell, depending on whether you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And your spirit goes back to the Father, Nisha Mahayim, that he gave to you. That was true in the life of Christ. When he died, his body went to the grave, his soul went to Hades, and his spirit returned to the Father. Into thy hands I commit my spirit, he said. And we call that trichotomy. We say that man is trichotomous. He has a body, soul, and spirit. We call that in theology. That's how we, we refer to that. Now, I've got a couple points, and then we'll take a little break, and we'll come back, and I, I've got another little study for you to connect with this. Right Now, here's Psalm 1610, point number one. In Psalm 1610, it places the soul of Jesus in Hades, which was in the heart of the earth. It was compared to Jonah in Matthew 12, 38 through 40. Jesus, in speaking on this subject matter, compared his three days and three nights in Hades as Jonah three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. <clears throat> well, it's worth your read. Matthew 12, 40, notice. Matthew 12, 40. See, look, I know a lot of people say that Jesus died on Friday, was buried on Saturday, and rose on Sunday. That's not true. How can you be in a grave three days and three nights? That's full, those are full days. Would you agree if you went to work and you had to work all day and all night, that'd be a full day? Well, it's easy. Matthew 12, 44, just as, watch this now, he's making a comparison. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, even so, that's a comparison, will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? The place that that's called in Hebrew is Sheol, and in Greek, Hades. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 9, now the expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? Here is Philippians 2, 10 and 11. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Listen to those three parts. <clears throat> every knee will bow to those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So we call Hades that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. <clears throat> Next week, I'm going to talk about what did Jesus do the three days he was there. 
He was on a mission. He was on a mission just like the cross. The burial was a mission and the resurrection is a mission. There are three missions that are unified as one. Christ dies on a cross. He's buried and he's raised from the dead. We call that the gospel. They're intertwined and interlinked. There are three missions as one. <clears throat> when Paul begins to talk about how we in Christ are related to his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, he says things like this. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but he who lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of God. He's going to say, in, he's going to say in, in Romans, the eighth chapter, verse 11, that the power that raised Jesus from the place of death now lives in the body of of every church age believer. The power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside your mortal body. That's Romans 8, 11. You are uniquely connected as a believer of the gospel of Jesus Christ in his death on the cross, in his burial, and in his resurrection. You just don't think enough about it. You should. What does it mean I have been crucified with Christ? What does it mean I've been buried with Christ? What does it mean I've been raised with Christ? What does that mean to your daily life? I'm going to talk about that next week. I've got a whole different subject. I've got to convince you to trust the word of God when it says that Jesus Christ went and spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And I've shown you all kinds of evidence. I mean, I just, I didn't come up with this stuff. Watch this now. One of the things that we discover from Paul's discussion in Philippians 2, 10, and 11. Of what occurred when he was in Hades. Now here's the problem with us. We read the Bible, but we don't study it. See, I just read. Did I read Philippians 2, 10, and 11 to you? I read it to you. I wrote it on the paper and read it to you. And you missed it. That's why I'm your teacher. You missed it. I've got to teach you not to be missing this stuff when you read the Bible. It's there in plain sight. Listen to what he said. Listen to what he said. Because you missed it. Listen to what he said. I'm, I'm under point one. So that at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee will bow, right? That's number one. And that every tongue would confess, right? That Jesus Christ is Lord, right? To the glory of God the Father. Agreed? Yes. Then he tells you where that's going to take place, right? Now, come on. See, this is where you got to study and not just read. Right? He told you three places that's going to be, that event, that's going to happen. Agreed? In, help me out, in heaven, on, on earth, and under the earth. Da, 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 da. So you see, I know something already from Paul that what's, what's going to transpire when Jesus goes to to Hades, agreed? What's going to happen? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, right? Yes. This is the only time we ever knew scripturally that Christ went to Hades. 
Now think about that. When is that going to take place? When is every knee going to bow and every tongue confess under the earth? It's already happened. Oh, dear hearts. Please study the Bible. Don't just read it. You don't get half what's there. Aren't you curious about this stuff? Come stay a year with me. The study of your Bible will become new and exciting in your life. You must not miss this kind of information. You must not miss it. Is that not important to us? I mean, who's going to preach that? I, who's going to preach that today? I don't know. It's a guy like me. A guy like me. See, when you read that stuff, you got to look for stuff. See, when I saw, I thought, well, you know, in heaven, that makes sense. On earth, that makes sense. Under the earth? Whoa. <laughs> that catches my attention. Here's point number two. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from Hades will be one of three final signs to Israel. In 1 Corinthians 1.22, Israel was a group of people that needed to have signs. Now, they had to be biblical. When they asked for signs, they were looking for biblical signs that would connect to some human experience going on. This is why Jesus did so many, so many miracles. Because the Messiah, prophetically, was to come and do some of the most unbelievable miracles. And that would prove he was the Messiah. He would raise the dead. He would put sight back into eyes that were blind from birth. He would do the most, and he was supposed to do these. It would be a sign to Israel. The more signs he gave them, the more signs they wanted. They never got enough. And so he talks about you keep cravings for signs, and they're never enough for you. You know why? Do you know when signs from the word of God is never enough for you and you keep craving for more? It's because you're in the flesh and not in the spirit. When you go to Bible study and it's never enough and you have a craving for, a, a craving for more and, you, and listen, and you make sure it's biblically oriented. They wanted signs. He gave them signs, signs, messianic signs. They didn't want to attach the name Christ to Jesus. They just couldn't bring themselves. They hated him so much as a political group of religious people. They hated him so much. They did not want to give him the title Christ. It even bothered them to call him a rabbi. These are people who are looking for things that don't fit what they want in their lifestyle. And uh, so they, they throw the word away. They throw the Bible away. If the church of Jesus Christ studied the Bible one-third the time that they watch television you would be dynamic. <clears throat> Church of Jesus Christ would get back to be on fire and great things would happen. Great things in your life would happen. You would be amazed what God is wanting to do through your life, but he can't do it through stupidity. He can't do it because you're illiterate. You're illiterate in the word of God. He does it because, listen, Listen, you can't even get prayer answered if you don't know what his will is. Well, you should read 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And when you pray according to the will of God, he hears every time and he answers. And when you don't pray according to his will, he, does, he, he listens, but he doesn't answer because he can't answer only compatible with his will. 
No. Happy Easter. In, in 1 Corinthians 1.22, we're told that Jews seek signs and Gentiles seek wisdom. I wish that was true. I would take that. I would take that. And so here are the three signs the Jew, the Jew wanted and got and still didn't believe. So much for signs. They wanted the sign of Jonah. They wanted a sign of the temple. And they wanted a sign of tongues. They got all three. I still didn't believe. <laughs> These are the three final signs to Israel. Matthew 12, 38 through 39. He answered and said to them, an evil, adulterous generation craves for a sign. No sign will be given it but the sign of Jonah. The generation that throws him on the cross the big sign to them is the sign of Jonah. Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. Even so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus gave him the sign of the temple. Everybody was worried about this. Everybody. He said, in three days, in three days, I'm, God's going to raise the temple. They went, oh, it's, took it, it's taken us 43, 46 years to build a temple and we're not even complete yet. And you're going you're gonna to raise it in three days, right? Well, this is where that discussion goes on in, math, in John 2, 19 through 22. Jesus said, destroy this temple. In three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it up in three days. Ha ha. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered, oh, hmm, that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures. Don't go, don't go away from any of my sermons. And somebody said, well, what'd you study today? And he got like, oh, geez. Uh, well, let's see. Something about three days in uh, Shio or Hades. I, go, oh, I, I never heard that before. You say, well, Ron says that, so it must be true. Don't ever say that. Don't ever say that. I give you scripture. This is not what I believe. This is what I believe. <laughs> but I believe it based on scripture. I give you scripture. I back up what I say. I just don't blow smoke. I give you scripture. I give you a lot of scripture. You should read Matthew 27 and 40. Well, I'm going to read some of this, Matthew. I got a couple minutes here. Matthew, I got another sermon for you in the second hour. So I know you're going to be tempted to beat the crowd. Uh, let that craving go too, okay? In Matthew 27, 40. Verse 38. We got two robbers being crucified, him one on the right, one on the left. The crowd that was passing by hurling, hurling abuses at him, Christ, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. And the same, same was being said by the priest and the elders, in other words, the religion and the Supreme Court. Drop down to 50, because you can read all this. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Matthew 27, 50. Be, watch this. As soon as he did it, watch what happened. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's the veil that separated the holy place from the holies of holies where the blood of Christ was a big deal. The day of atonement and all that. <laughs> I mean, the temple, he rendered, listen, when something like that happens, the temple is, is rendered inactive. You cannot 
the veil is there is to keep these two separate ideas. The veil was torn from where? From what to what? Top to bottom. Yeah, from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. Tombs were opened. Watch this now. Many don't preach this either. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. <laughs> How would you like that house call? House call. Uh, he just buried Uncle, Uncle Fred, uh, uh, you know, uh, 10 days ago. He's knocking on the front door, wanting to know if lunch is ready. <laughs> How about that? Huh? That'd catch your attention, wouldn't it? Maybe the crucifixion didn't. Maybe the resurrection didn't. Maybe, maybe crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, maybe none of those did it. But Uncle, Uncle Fred showed up at the house. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm saying a lot of stuff happened to cause us to believe that Jesus Christ, the Messianic Savior of the world, went to the cross to die for our sins as the Lamb of God, which knew no sin, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. And so many things happened beyond his death, burial, and resurrection that were spectacular. The earthquake came, an angel descended, rolled the tomb that had the Roman seal on it, rolled it aside. All the temple guards that were there fell over like dead men. I gave you other passages that would be well worth your read. 63, 64, uh, 28, 6. Does that, that kind of worry you? The problem is, I, when I hear, I don't know if that's a foreign model or an American model. Do you? I mean, do you know the sound of your horn? That's why everybody gets up and walks out. I don't know. I, they ought to have a, a tune on it like your phone. <laughs> they go like, yeah, that's mine. I know where my car is. Or, or do they have that? I'm so far behind the times. I, well, wait, here, let me finish before I lose everybody with more cars. <laughs> the sign of tongues. The sign. Well, did we get taken care of, gentlemen? Did you catch a thief? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Texas. Did I hear Texas? Yeah. All right. Anyhow. You pick up the whole idea of the sign of tongues is picked up in Acts 2, agreed? Sign of tongues. Uh, at Pentecost. At Pentecost. In Acts, the second chapter is a great chapter on this. And it, 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 uh, Gentile, Gen, Jews speaking in Gentile languages, a language they had never learned, didn't know what they said, uh, and it was preaching the gospel to Gentiles that had come in as Jews. They, they were Jews living in Gentile nations. Here, 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 here's one of the things that said, brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet, it, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, and, he, and he's, he's going he's to quote Isaiah 28, 11, and 12. By men of strange tongues, foreign languages, I will speak to this people, Jewish. Even so, they will not listen to me, of course, says the Lord. So then, watch this. So then, tongues are for a sign. To whom? The Jewish people in Gentile languages. Not to those who believe, but to those who don't believe. Not to those who believe, but to those who unbelieve. But prophecy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who are are believers. See, so you need to, look, now, 
in, in 1 Corinthians 14, this is where Paul deals with this. That's not my subject. I'm just showing you something. I'm showing you something about signs to the Jewish. In John 14, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, 21, where in verse 20, uh, brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Uh, in regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking about God, be mature. In the law, it's written, and if you have a study Bible, he's quoting Isaiah 28, 11. In the law, it's written, uh, and actually, that's a prophetic book that he called the law, which is a whole other subject. In the law, it's written, by men of strange tongues, foreign tongues, and by lips of strangers, foreigners, I will speak to this people, Jewish, that's who Isaiah is writing to. Isaiah, I'm reading Isaiah 28 uh, to this people. Even so, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then, tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to the unbeliever. But prophecy is for a sign not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. Then he goes on to about church assembly and how they should function and all that. Do you know what Isaiah 28 is about? Do you have any idea what Isaiah 28 is about? Where the quotes this from? It's about the five cycles of divine discipline to Israel. Which they were under. And that's why we have so many foreign languages in town. Because these people have been dispersed across the world. And while this is being discussed, they're under Roman rule. You know, Pilate. Not the guy who flies an airplane, but who governs. All right? Well, three signs. The one I'm after is the sign of Jonah and the sign of the temple. And the third sign is connected because it happened at Pentecost, which was the fourth of the Levitical Messianic, Leviticus, the Levitical 20, chapter 23. You got, Pass, you got Passover, unleavened bread. In unleavened bread, you have first fruits over to Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. All of that's linked. All of it's linked. Uh, save your paper because on the back side we're going to take a couple notes in the second hour. Uh, so it, we won't be here long. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> that for sure is a kiss of death in it. But we are going to meet. We're going to have a little music second half and I, I have a study for you r related to what we're talking about. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way today. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God is taught. We're after truth, Father. Not just a bunch of information, we're after the truth. So I know the Holy Spirit will give us the truth. And Jesus said, truth is an important principle because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Three very important issues to Christ. And so I'm thankful for that. So we, we come with truth today as best we understand it, and the Holy Spirit will clean it up. We know that. It's his responsibility. So we take an offering, Father. We pray we'd spend a little on ourselves and most on reaching Moody, Sinclair, Alabama, the United States, and the uttermost parts of the earth. It is our mission call in Jesus' name. Amen. The opportunity uh, to give a, a second lesson today, but I, I, I have one that I wanted to give. It's from the book of John. <clears throat> and I want to use it I, 
I, I want to use it to, to, to help you understand how to study the Bible rather than just read it. You look for stuff as you read it. You look for stuff and you ask yourself questions. And it just makes it more exciting to me when you do that kind of Bible study uh, rather than just read. Well, I'm in the 20th chapter of uh, John where, where we're dealing with an empty tomb. Uh, they have found an empty tomb <laughs> and they're kind of like in a quorum about what's going on here. We've got disciples running here and running there. and So they take a look in there and they, they find in verse 7, they find a face, a face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with a linen wrapping, but rolled up in a special place by itself. Another disciple had first come to the tomb. When he entered, he saw and believed. Now watch verse 9. So the disciples, that's plural, so the disciples went away again. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you, uh, that's, this is John 20, verse 9, uh, or when, verse 10. They have come in verse 9, yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. They found an empty tomb, but they can't connect it to the resurrection of Christ. Right? They found it. They found, they didn't find a body. They found a lot of stuff, but they couldn't find a body. And it, it, they haven't been able to connect the dots. Even though he's taught a lot about the third day. In fact, the third day resurrection, the third day of, of his burial, even the populace of Israel that had paid attention to him knew that he had declared on the third day he would, he would come out of the grave. It was a common... Even the thieves on the cross talked about it. The people that walked around the cross talked about it. And here are the disciples, and we're told they come, and they can't, they don't, they can't connect the dots. In verse 9, for as yet. They did not understand the scriptures, like Psalm 1610, a very popular messianic psalms, that he must rise from the dead. Now watch verse 10. So the disciples went away again. Now watch. They're going to do this three times. At times that were crucial, they're going to, they're going to walk away from a wonderful prophetic miracle of prophecy, the crucifixion of Christ, the three-day burial as resurrection. They haven't been able to connect the dots prophetically, scripturally. Have they been taught it? Listen, if you study the book of Matthew and start with the 16th chapter and just look for the subject of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, how much Jesus taught on it, Matthew 16, 17, uh, 20, uh, 26, 27. He was constantly teaching the disciples. In fact, Peter got so disgusted with him talking about it, it Peter considered mor mor morbid that he took him aside and rebuked Jesus for teaching on it. You remember Matthew 16, 21 through 23. Now this has actually come to pass, the things that Christ had, had talked about in, in lengthy discussions of Bi at Bible study. But they said in class, and when he told them things, it didn't fit their false narrative, so they didn't believe it. Right? It, did, it didn't fit their false narrative. Their false narrative was, there, there's, there can't be a cross 
when we're looking for a throne. We're looking for a king, not a messianic savior. And he kept talking about a messianic savior. It just didn't fit the narrative. So they went to Bible study. They listened to what he said and just let it pass in one ear and out the other because they thought they had a handle on this. But the very man they should have a handle on, they weren't paying any attention to him. Look how it's described. Look how it's described now. So the disciples went away again to their home. Watch the first time. He's arrested. All the disciples, he's arrested. And taken away, they left him. He told them at the Last Supper they were all going to desert him, but nobody believed it. They all, they all left him and went home. He goes through two, two mock trials on the 14th and Ias in, in, the, in the nighttime. He goes through two mock trials, one by the Jews and one by the Romans. And he's convicted. He is falsely convicted of a capital crime. Everybody in their right mind know that the last thing this man could have ever been charged with was a capital crime. Yet they charged him with it. Because the political group and the religious group have gotten together and want this man dead. They want him dead. They're tired of messing with him. They want him dead. So the second time the disciples went away and went home was the crucifixion. He's hung on a cross. They didn't come out and support it. They didn't believe in it. The third time is the resurrection. They come and they look at the tomb. Some believed and some didn't. That's what we're told in John. And those who didn't, it didn't fit their narrative. Look, so the disciples went away, what? Again. To their own home. Then we have an interesting part. I'm not going to read it, but we have Mary. Mary is from 11 through about 18. Mary Magdalene. She comes, she can't find it. She goes out. The, the body's not there. She goes out and she meets somebody that she thinks the gardener. And so he asks him, what's happened to the body? And she realizes in an instant that the man she's talking to is Jesus in a resurrected body. And so there's that discussion. You want to read about that, you read about it in 11 through 18. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. And then she goes back and talks to the disciples. Now I pick this subject up where we are today in John 19, John 20, verse 19. John 20, verse 19. So when evening on the, that day, the first day of the week, that's, we're in unleavened bread, and that's, We've been through the weekly Sabbath and the first day. That's, that's the feast of, of uh, first fruits. The day of his resurrection. Evening on the day that the, of the, uh, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said, Peace be with you. That's interesting in itself, isn't it? We probably would have had a lot more to say. <laughs> oh, well, where they were when I went through all this. And when he had said this, now watch this. He showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Now, here, this is an important question. You, you think you got the answer, may, you may not. What body are we talking about? 
Is it a unique resurrected body? Wait a minute now. It is a resurrection body. But is it a unique resurrection body? How do I know? Watch this. Watch this now. Let me find my place. He showed them both his hands and his side. Why did he show them their hands? Even even nailed to the cross. They're visible. And why did he show them their, his side? But he's in a resurrection body. How about that? Does that not disturb you? When you read that, do you go like, what? He is in a resurrection body because of his Mary's from the dead. But this is a unique this is a unique body and we were told earlier it would be because it would only be how many days in the grave that that body that he's going to come out with is going to have all of the elements of resurrection and all the appearance of physical is that not an amazing look that does that happen do you go like what? See, that's the stuff that grabs me. This is highly unusual and unique. See, none of us, we, we all know that we're getting a brand new body. I had a wonderful guy in my church. M- many of the pe- older people in here know David, David Wisnat, who was crippled all his life. And he couldn't wait to get a resurrection body because he's going to get a whole brand new deal. And I believe that. Jesus got a resurrection body. But it had characteristics of his physical body, didn't it? (laughs) Yeah, he's Jesus. They can do what he wants. I agree with that. But as a student of the word, we struggle a little bit with stuff like that. Because it is a resurrection body. And listen, that resurrection body, now listen to me. It's going to go back and be seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And one day he's coming back for you and I. And when we see him, guess what we'll look to see? You think you're going to see those nail-scarred hands? And that side? Oh, yeah. Because that's the resurrection. And listen, in eternity, in eternity, He's going to be a wonderful visual aid of the crucifixion, is he not? I'm amazed at that stuff. See, this is the stuff that gets me up in the middle of the night and goes back and researches and go like, what? See, this is why I love to study the Bible. I want you to learn to to study it and see things. When you read that, you go like, what in the world is going on? Now, let me show you how, how wonderful this is. Now, drop down to verse 24. And, and, of course, this is a famous doubting Thomas. Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was with them when Jesus came. So other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And who is he talking about? He's talking about a resurrected Lord. Everybody said, Jesus has been raised from the dead. Everybody. And they have now, all the disciples have seen him and most of the women And he sees the right hand of God the Father. And one day you're going to see him. And when you see him, he's going to show you the scars of your salvation. The cost to get you to heaven. 
the cost of heaven. You think it's a cheap way to go? Huh? Cheap way to go? Oh, you Christians, you take the easy way out. Listen, we don't take no easy way out. We go through the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Christ, or we don't get in. That ain't no easy road. That's no easy road. Well, but you say all you have to do is believe. Yeah, but you do have to believe. Let me tell you, I found that to be a very difficult thing. When I heard the gospel of Christ, it took me two years to come to a place that I would believe it. It was so out there. So he, Thomas, the other disciples said to Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He said to him, unless I see in his hands the imprints of nails and put my finger in the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Wow. Eight days later. Mm. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with him. And Jesus came and the doors having been shut and stood in the midst said, peace be with you. You see, you're not getting that. You are not getting that. Has he said that twice now? Yeah. You're not getting that. Is that a big point? It is to him. Listen, all teachers that do repetition are trying to get a point across. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you want, when you go back today sometime, and turn the television, let your family watch something, and then you go off and take your concordance in the back of your study Bible and look up the word peace and do a study, and you will find something marvelous why he said that twice. I don't have time today to explain it. Another day. Then he said to Thomas, reach here your fingers and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it in my side. We're talking about a resurrection body. And do not be unbelieving, but be believing. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. How about you? I mean, do you have to see the proof of the crucifixion of Christ? His burial and resurrection before you can believe? Listen, if you think you need to see that, it's too late for you. Because the next time he comes, he comes for everybody who are people of the church in the rapture. He is not coming again to doubting Thomases. You must believe the scriptures. Are you here today? Let me tell you, going to church ain't going to get you saved. Ain't going to get you saved. Going to church. Believing that Christ died on that cross for your sins was buried and raised from the dead on the third day is what gets you saved. And we have to believe it and take it by faith because we can't. We have to take the witness of the word. And one day, you will see it. Make sure he's not set down the great white throne judgment when you see it. We'll all see those nail-scarred hands and that punctured side. So I thank you today for that. When you, when you study the Bible, when you read the Bible, study it. Look for things in there. Look for things in there. Look and see if you can't find some wonderful things in the Bible that are just there for the taking. If you would just say, why did he say that? See, curious minds want to know. Curious minds want to know. Well, I'm one of those curious minds. <laughs>
Uh, so, Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us on this Easter 23. Thank you, Father, for sending us to Moody. It's put a fresh breath of the breath of the Holy Spirit in my soul. Especially when I see people who have studied the Bible most of their life and have never really, they've read it but never studied it. That they might come to understand we're the, te- we're the church that teaches it. We teach the Bible so that you can learn and grow in the knowledge of the word of God and his grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.